I'll wait for just a moment. There it is now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural Global Lecture Series with Arun Gandhi, grandson to Mahatma Gandhi. My name is Song Sony Yang, and I have the pleasure of serving as a director for the Office of International Student Scholar Services. Since my arrival at Augustana in May of 2019, the Global Lecture Series has been my dream to see take place on campus. So tonight, as you can imagine, this event happening is quite monumental for me. The Global Lecture Series will coincide with the annual celebration of International Education Week. It will aim to support notable scholars, guest speakers to discuss a variety of global topics, support students and community members to develop global awareness and broaden their perspective of the world, developments, and opportunities. In addition, this innovative initiative is aimed at fostering global awareness, engaging thought-provoking discussions on diverse international topics, and infusing internationalization throughout the campus community. The Global Lecture Series could not be made possible without the support of the following offices and staff. John Deere, the Presidential Center of Faith and Learning, spearheaded by Dr. Jason Mann, Professor of Religion, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, spearheaded by Dr. Monica Smith, the first Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Bettina Bolger. In addition, the Office of International Student and Scholar Services and Juanita Trevino Perez, International Advisor. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Before we begin our Global Lecture Series program this evening, I would like to invite Dr. Monica Smith, Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, to say a few words. Good evening, good evening, and thank you for being here as we launch our inaugural Global Lecture Series. On behalf of Augustana College, the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, I want to welcome each of you and thank you for coming and joining with us tonight on this momentous occasion, again, as we launch our global lecture series. Unfortunately, President Talentino um, was, is traveling today and is unable to join us. She sends her regrets and I will just share a few uh, remarks on her behalf and also on my behalf as the Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer. Tonight, I stand here witnessing a dream come true. The Global Lecture Series is an initiative that Song, Sony and I have discussed for the last three years. Augustana College has had a longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging. And in the past few years, we have seen our aspirations evolve into realities. The student body is more diverse than ever, and now students represent about 42 nations across the globe. And so we are an international campus, and it makes sense to have a well-known, well-renowned speaker uh, from the international stage launch this series for us. Our international students enrich our campus and extend our awareness and knowledge in ways that many other groups cannot. They bring with them cultures from their countries, their regions, their home communities, their language, their foods, celebrations, rituals, ways of knowing and ways of doing. Augustana College and the Quad Cities community are truly beneficiaries of not only their presence, but their contributions. The Global Lecture Series aligns with the college's recent efforts toward internationalization, including substantive revision of the Global Awareness Core Curriculum course requirement, where our students are required to take a course in our general curriculum so that they can learn more about our ever-shrinking world, so that they can be better equipped to understand cultures around the region and very important, significant issues across the globe. We also added diversity, equity, and inclusion as a component of tenure and promotion for our faculty. Our faculty do so much already with our students, but adding this as a measure for their continued progress 
certainly it elevates our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for our faculty doing this was an opportunity to hold themselves accountable to this very high standard and the rigor that, it, that is necessary to continue to learn and to be a scholar of the globe. We also are participating in the American Council on Education's International Lab. Augustana is one of 13 higher education institutions from around the country to participate in this project. Our approach to internationalization at the college will focus on enhancing the strategic global engagement of our institution and to educate globally minded students who are respectful of cultural diversity and will be prepared to succeed in today's diverse and changing world. The goal is to focus on strengthening international perspectives across our campus. This lecture series is another step toward actualizing our commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and internationalization. But also internationalizing our campus and preparing a generation of students who will be leaders that will create a more just world. Tonight would not be possible, as Song Sony said, without the John Deere Foundation, who sponsored this series with a significant grant. I want to thank Emily Clayton, the John Deere representative who worked with members of our advancement team to make this happen. We appreciate that John Deere is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, similar to Augustana College. They celebrate diversity, champion equity, and promote inclusiveness so that all people can make the greatest impact and be true to themselves. In addition to celebrating diversity, equity, and inclusion, John Deere extends that commitment across the globe, including here in the Quad Cities. John Deere believes in the power of citizenship and is committed to giving back in bold ways. One of those bold ways, one of those bold commitments is the John Deere Foundation investing $100 million in the families and youth who live, work, learn, um, in John Deere's home communities to ensure their inclusive and equitable access to resources and educational opportunities. Tonight will be one of those wonderful education opportunities. They're committed to human dignity and self-sufficient, self-sufficiency. Annual investments of $2 million in food banks will provide the equivalent of 100 million meals over the next de decade, and investments in youth education will reach at least one million underserved and underrepresented youth. And so we are extremely excited and grateful to John Deere Foundation and that they saw value and promise in Augustana College's global lecture series. In addition to Emily Clayton and the John Deere Foundation, I need to express gratitude to Lori Roderick, the Associate Vice President of Development, and Megan Christensen, Manager of Grants and Corporate Relations, who understood our vision for the Global Lecture Series and sought the necessary funding for this to happen. Could we please give them a round of applause? We know that nothing happens in a silo and everything we do in diversity, equity, and inclusion at Augustana uh, extends across the campus. Finally, before Song Sony introduces our speaker, I want to note that Mr. Gandhi's work aligns with Augustana's commitment to social justice. Augustana's commitment to social justice reads as follows. Our college enc encourages the development of a campus community that seeks justice, loves kindness, and acts with love and humility. Augustana commits to making our campus and the, world, and the wider world a more livable place for all persons by loving and serving the neighbor and by acting against injustice and intolerance. Again, thank you for being here and sharing in this momentous occasion with us. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Arun Gandhi. Dr. Arun Gandhi's professional career comprised, com, my apologies, comprised of furthering his grandfather's global message of nonviolence. 
His professional and philanthropist endeavors have include, included, but it was not limited to, being a journalist for over 30 years, writing for the Times of India where he retired as a deputy editor, a regular contributor to the Washington Post, and of course, an author to multiple books. His philanthropy works have spanned the rescue of 127 orphans, helping transform lives across 300 villages to co-founding several nonviolence programs and institutions across the United States. Dr. Arun Gandhi is the fifth grandson to Mahatma Gandhi. Born in Durban, South Africa, Dr. Gandhi grew up during the rule of the apartheid laws. Arun's childhood was impacted by these discriminatory practices which electrified racial discord. This led to harboring anger based upon the ill treatment he experienced and soon began to get into fights. At the age of 12, Arun's parents took him to India not only to meet his grandfather, Habuji, but also entrusted his care to help the young grandson cope with his inner fury and transform it for good. Tonight, he will share his grandfather's message of transformational power of channeling one's anger into an agent of for doing good. It is my honor to welcome guest speaker, Dr. Arun Gandhi, to the podium tonight. Good evening, everybody. And may I request that we have a little more light in the auditorium so I can see if people are going to sleep? Or <laughs> Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening and to be the first speaker in the series, uh, global series. Uh, it's a great honor. And uh, I wonder if I really deserve that kind of honor, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. um, before I begin with my talk, I'd like to invite all of you to participate in a little game. I'd like you to partner up with the person sitting next to you. Everybody has a partner, temporary partners. <laughs> I'd like one member of the partnership to make a tight fist and imagine that you have the world's most precious diamond and the other member of the partnership to open the fist. Okay, thank you very much. Now tell me honestly, how many of you asked the other person to open the fist? <laughs> so you see, we are violent. We are all violent. And we need to do something about that. So don't, don't assume that violence doesn't exist in you because you don't fight and don't go around beating up people. Violence is there in various different forms. And I learned this from my grandfather when I was living with him at the age of 12. And one day I was coming back from school and I had a little pencil in my hand and it was about three inches long, and I thought I deserved a better pencil. It was too small for me to use. And without a second thought, I just threw the pencil away. I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening, <clears throat> when I met grandfather and asked him for a new pencil, Instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on. And I couldn't understand 
why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be joking. You don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh, yes, I do. He has a flashlight. And I think I spent about two hours searching for the pencil, and when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that in, because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world. And because we overconsume them, people elsewhere have to live without that, and they live in poverty. And that is violence against, nat uh, against human beings. And that was the first time I realized that all of these little things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that have become so much a part of our nature that we don't even realize we are committing violence, that all of this constitute some form of violence. And then to make me understand this lesson thoroughly, he made me draw a genealogical tree of violence, just as we would do a family tree with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that I had experienced during the day. Things that may have happened to me or things that I may have done to other people or things that I may have read about. All of that had to ex be examined and put in their appropriate places. Now, physical violence is something that we all know and experience because we see it every day. It's all the fighting and killing and beating and murders and rapes and all of these things that we do to one another where physical force is used. But passive violence is something so deeply ingrained in us by the culture of violence that pervades us and everything else, that we don't even realize we are committing violence. And the way I had to determine whether this was passive violence or not was to ask myself the simple question. If somebody were to do this to me, would I be helped by it, or would I be hurt by it? And if I came to the conclusion that it would hurt me, then that would be passive violence. And that could take the form of so many things. Discrimination, oppression, judging people, looking down on people, uh, labeling people, you know, hundreds and hundreds of things that we do every day, even wasting food. I, w I read in the New York Times not long ago that in this country, in the United States alone, we throw away $160 billion worth of food every year. $160 billion worth of food goes into the garbage every year. And yet we have people in our own country who go to bed hungry. Now that's the worst form of passive violence. So there are many things within us that we commit passive violence all the time. And when I began to do this introspection, 
I was amazed that within a few months, I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. The physical violence didn't grow very much, but the, because there's a limit to what you can do physically. But the passive violence grew endlessly. And that is when I became aware of all the weaknesses that existed within me. And once you become aware of it, when you see it in black and white on the wall in front of you, then you are uh, tempted to do something to correct it. Otherwise, we live in denial and say that we don't fight and we don't go around beating up people so we are nonviolent people. But we are not nonviolent, as I just demonstrated to you. And so it's very important for us to do this introspection, to be honest about it and to see all our weaknesses and transform those weaknesses into strengths. Now that is part of our education system. Not necessarily the education that we get in schools and colleges, but education is a lifelong thing. We never stop learning. If we stop learning, we stop living. So learning is a lifelong thing. And part of that learning is to improve ourselves, to become better human beings. You know, we seem to think that uh, once we have gotten our education and degrees from the schools and colleges, then we don't have to do anything else and we can just go out and make money and have fun. That's not life. Life is not just about making money and having fun. Life is about how are we going to enhance this world? How, are, how is our presence in this world going to be benefit this world? And what can we do to make it better? We can make the world better by making ourselves better. And we can make ourselves better when we acknowledge all our weaknesses and transform those weaknesses into strengths. So it's a very important lesson. I think in many ways that particular lesson transformed my life and made a difference in me. And I'm sure if you do it, you'll see that it makes a very big difference in your attitude and, and uh, uh, relationship with the rest of the world. The second most important lesson that I learned from grandfather was about anger. I was angry as a young boy because I lived in South Africa and I was beaten up at the age of 10 by some white youths because of the color of my skin. And then a few months later, beaten up by some blacks because they didn't like the color of my skin either. And I, it filled me with a lot of rage. And I wanted eye for an eye justice and wanted to fight back again. And that's when my parents decided to take me to India and leave me with grandfather for a few years and hopefully learn from him. And so the lesson on anger was a profound lesson. He taught me that anger is like electricity. It's just as useful and just as powerful, but only if we use it intelligently but it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we use electricity intelligently and bring it into our lives and use it to, uh, for 
the good of our lives, we must learn to use anger in the same way, intelligently, so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse it and cause death and destruction. Today we don't speak about anger. We don't teach anger. We just leave it to each individual to find their own ways of dealing with it. And the result is that we all end up abusing anger when, you know, when we get angry. Now, it's been re uh, recognized by Harvard University when they did a research that anger generates more than 80% of the violence that we experience in our personal lives or in the lives of our nations. So if we learn to use that energy intelligently and positively, we would be able to reduce violence very substantially in our life as well as our nation's lives. Now I find that violence has increased everywhere. It, there's hardly a single country in the world where there is no violence of any sort. And this is growing tremendously and largely because of the disparities that exist uh, in our societies and the disparities that we do nothing about. We just let them fester. My grandfather recognized this more than a hundred years ago. And before him, an English economist, John Ruskin, recognized this in 1850s. And he wrote an article, actually three articles. And when they were published, all the uh, industrialists and business people in England were so angry that they banished him from England and uh, he had to go out and live elsewhere for the rest of his life. And not, nothing that he wrote was ever published after that. And the gist of what he wrote was that the economic policies that we are pursuing now, and this is, he wrote in 1850s, and we are still pursuing the same economic policies. He said that is going to lead to more disparities because the policies benefit only the privileged people. The privileged benefit from it and, and get richer, and those who don't have the privilege marg get marginalized, and they live in poverty. And he said that's going to create a lot of violence and a lot of um, unhappiness in the world. The ideal policy would be one that benefits everybody equally. Now, when I talk about this, even when John Ruskin wrote this, everybody condemned him as a communist. When my grandfather talked about it and wrote about it, because that influenced him substantially, they <clears throat> also branded him as a communist. And when I talk about it, people say, this is communist and we don't want communism in this country. Now, this is not communism. This is compassion. So let's not just, you know, wa wash away th good things. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a bad throat and so... Um, you know, we, we tend to, um, you know, brush away things that we 
don't like as, as communism and socialism and we don't want it here. But uh, what Ruskin said and what my grandfather said was that there is something like compassionate capitalism and that we need to pursue compassionate capitalism, which means that we don't amass wealth for ourselves, but we use the talent to make wealth and share it with society, to, with, with the people who work for us and for the society in general. But today we see that 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 is an alien concept. People make money for themselves and want to get rich and they don't care what happens to other people. They don't even care what happens to their own workers. The workers are paid miserable salaries. There's unhappiness there. And everybody is unhappy except the rich who get richer. And they, even they are unhappy because they don't know what to do with all that wealth. But this is a destructive way of going and we need to correct that and make a difference there. There are many uh, people, even in this country, I read a book and unfortunately I've forgotten the title of that book, but it, it uh, listed many corporations in this country which were pursuing this idea of compassionate capitalism. One of them <clears throat> happens to be this Chobani yogurt people, started by a refugee when he came into this country. And uh, his he started in a little town in New York State, and as the factory grew, the, uh, his workers grew along with it. He paid them a fair wage. He gave them all the benefits, even benefits which were not required by law. He uh, allowed them to take maternity leave. He started kindergarten facilities for children in his factories. He even plowed back a lot of the profits in the town to benefit the town and, and all the people, even those who were not working for him. And um, he's so liked by the, his workers and the people of the town that they stand by him always through thick, thick and thin. And he's doing well. He's making a lot of yogurt and a lot of money. And that is what compassionate capitalism is. That you make money, but you share it with all the people and all the workers and everybody and, uh, and see to their benefit and welfare. So uh, it is possible to do this but we need to have that uh, mindset to do it. When I came to this country and um, started the Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence as part of the program to teach people nonviolence, I realized very quickly that people wanted to know what can they do I individually? They, you know, we have that mindset that we can't do anything by ourselves. We need to have a big organization and a lot of money to be able to do this. And I wanted to show them that you can do wonderful things individually and uh, help a lot of people. So I identified uh, people, some of them my friends, who were working in India, who started off as individuals, 
um, because they were so committed to Gandhi's philosophy. And um, over a period of 25, 30 years, they've made such a big difference uh, that they've affected the lives of uh, millions of people. So I, I take a group every year on a Gandhi legacy tour, and most of them are students. And uh, we go around India and visit all of these programs and see, uh, you know, firsthand what they are doing and how they are doing it. I don't know whether it has impressed anybody or not. I do get a substantial number of people every year. So I think that somewhere some seed is being planted and um, you know, the, there's some benefit to it. But I'd like to share with you some of those uh, experiences to show you how you can make a difference uh, in life too. There's one institution that is called the Barefoot College. And he calls it Barefoot College because he insists that he will work only with women, all middle-aged women who have had their children and, uh, and done with that. And they have to be totally illiterate. He doesn't want anybody with any education at all. Now this young man <clears throat> graduated from the Inst Indian Institute of Technology in India, which is uh, the equivalent of the MIT. And the graduates from that institution are picked up by corporations in the Western countries, and they get very good jobs highly paid jobs because their degrees are uh, well recognized. But this young man told his parents, said, before I settle down to taking a job, I want to spend one year in a village to help the poor people. And then I will, after that one year, I will take up a job and uh, pursue a normal vocation. So very reluctantly, his parents agreed and let him go. And he went to this village, and it's now 33 years, and he's still in that village. And he started this barefoot college. Now, he used his... Uh, education, his uh, learning from MIT. He was an electrical engineer. So he teaches these uneducated women to uh, build solar panels out of uh, scrap material and install those panels and do all the wiring and electrification of the house and the whole village and everything, how to maintain all those wirings and all that. And um, in six months, they get a certificate as being electrical uh, engineers, and they go out and electrify their villages. Several hundred villages in India have been electrified with these kind of solar panels. And uh, these women, um, their status has risen. Earlier, because they were women, they were looked down upon uh, because they didn't bring in any money. Uh, and uh, now they earn money, and uh, they are required to maintain the electrical circuit and power. So their status has risen, and even the men look up to them. And uh, so that was an additional benefit that was not really planned for, but uh, it's happened. 
but that program has been going on for nearly 33 years now. And uh, it came, recently came uh, to the attention of the United Nations. And the United Nations asked him if he would consider training women from other developing countries and uh, using the solar techniques. And he said, yes, as long as they uh, are all you know, meet the requirements, they have to be middle-aged women and they have to be totally uneducated. So now you go to the Barefoot College and you'll find women from African countries, from um, Latin American countries, from several other developing countries, all sitting together in one big classroom with Indian uh, students and all learning together. None of them know each other's language, but they still get along beautifully with each other. And it's really a, a, an education to see how all these people from different places can live together happily and, and uh, even they, though they can't speak to each other, they can get along beautifully with each other. That is one remarkable program started by one person uh, and he's made a difference in the lives of millions of people, not only in India but elsewhere too. The other program, <coughs> also started by an individual. He was a doctor and working, working for the state government. And after a while, he got tired of the work there and uh, he decided to go and settle down in a small village in the state of Rajasthan which is uh, mostly desert, uh, you know, there's a big desert there and, and the weather is changing and much of the state is becoming a desert. There's very little water. And uh, he went and settled down in a village hoping to practice medicine among the poor people. But instead, one day he, you know, uh, uh, he got a strange visitor, an old man from the village, who came up to him and he said, we don't need your medicine. What we need is water. Bring us water. And he said, well, I'm a trained doctor. I don't know how, how to get water for you. So he, the old man said, come with me and I'll show you. So the old man took him out <coughs> and showed him that, you know, this is a mountainous region. So he showed him all the crevices in the mountain caused by rainfall. When the rains come, the water flows down the mountain and disappears because there's nothing to hold it back again. So the old man said, all we need is to build little dams, series of dams along these crevices, so that when the rains come, the water doesn't flow away, it stays there and soon it would seep into the groundwater and raise the groundwater level. So, and then, a few days later, the old man died. So this doctor felt obliged, you know, to uh, pursue his death wish and uh, do something about it. So he went and learned a little more about um, how to uh, save rainwater and harvest rainwater and, and, um, and he realized that much of what he learned in books 
was already what the old man told him. So he came back and uh, he had a, some land and those, uh, you know, rainwater was flowing through his land. So he built a series of dams, small dams, earthen dams along the uh, course of the rain, rainwater drainage. And very soon, like the old man said, the water stayed and began to seep in. And, uh, you know, he started getting um, groundwater, the groundwater levels rose. And when the rest of the village people saw this, they all came to him and said, help us also. And he began to help all of these people uh, do the same thing. And now, after about 25, 30 years, he has been able to reclaim 1,000 square miles of territory and changed it from a desert to a verdant field. There's uh, all kinds of vegetation growing. Uh, there's so much water in that area that uh, the farmers who were getting one crop a year, barely one crop a year, now get about three to four crops every year. Their uh, life has changed and uh, water still flows. He has created lakes. He has revived eight rivers which were dried up. Now they are flowing uh, rivers. And all this done by one man who dedicated his life to uh, achieving this. So one person can do great things. And uh, if we have that compassion and that dedication to uh, serve people, not just serve ourselves, but serve people in general, which is what we need today. We see part of the philosophy of nonviolence that I learned from grandfather is about rela relationships, not only our interpersonal relationships with each other, but international relationships with different countries. Today we all live in isolation. Every country thinks that they can preserve their ecology and, and environment and uh, save the world, but no country, however powerful, will be able to save themselves if the rest of the world is going down the tube. So however rich we may be in this country, and however much money we spend in this country to change our environment and ecology, we will not be able to succeed if we don't help the rest of the world achieve the same goals. It's uh, all interconnected and interrelated. And that is what relationships are. Today, our relationships with each other are built on self-interest. Not thinking about what am I going to gain from this relationship, and if I don't gain anything from it, why should I bother to uh, cultivate it? But relationships ideally should be built on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance and appreciation. We have to respect each other and respect ourselves. And most importantly, we have to respect our connection with all of creation. You know, we seem to think that we are independent individuals and we can do whatever we like and it's nobody's business. We are not independent individuals and we cannot do whatever we like and get away with it. 
we are all interconnected and interrelated, and we have to respect that. It's only when we learn to respect that that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on Earth. We are not here by accident. We are not here to while away our time from birth to death making money. We are here for a purpose, and each one of us has a purpose. And at the very least, the purpose for each one of us is to ensure that our presence has made this world a little better. And when we understand that and when we begin to do that, then we will be able to accept each other as human beings and not identify people by labels. Today we identify people by labels. We have so many labels, gender labels and religious labels and economic labels and you name it, and we have a label. And we identify people only by those labels. We just got to remove those labels and look at each other as human beings and respect each other as human beings. And when we are able to do that, then we will appreciate our own humanity. So that is what relationships and nonviolence means. So these are things that I learned from my grandfather and uh, I've been trying to share this with as many people as possible. But in conclusion, I'd like to share with you one story that my grandfather was very fond of telling us, the story of uh, an ancient Indian king who once became very curious of, about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came there and did their best. And uh, the king was not satisfied. Then there was an individual who came from another town and he went to pay his uh, homage to the king. And the king asked him uh, <clears throat> the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this question. So the next day, the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house, came back with a grain of wheat, and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm, and said, here is your answer. And of course, the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace, and he didn't want to show his ignorance. So he just quietly clutched that grain of wheat, went back to his palace, found a little gold box and placed that grain of wheat in the box. And every day he would open the box to see if he could find an answer. And of course he couldn't find any answers. So a few days later, <clears throat> when the uh, intellectual came back on a return visit, the king asked him to explain said, you sent me to the sage and he gave me this grain of wheat and I don't know what the grain of wheat has to do with peace. So please explain. That's when the sage said, it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish and that will be the end of the story. But if you had allowed this grain of wheat to interact with all the elements, if you had planted this outside in the soil, it would sprout, <coughs> excuse me, 
sprout and grow, and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. So I have come to you today with the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather, and I am sharing it with you. And I hope that you won't let it rot and perish, but let it interact so that all of us together can make this world a better place for future generations. Thank you. another round of applause for Mr. Arun Gandhi. Certainly a very touching speech that'll keep us reflecting for a long time. We're going to move into our question and answer period now. We'll spend a little bit of time digging a little bit deeper with Mr. Gandhi. And so if you have a question for him, there are two microphones. Um, on either side of the auditorium, please make your way there. And after the question and answer period, uh, there are some books. I think we're probably all sold out of our books now, but we'll have a, a book signing following the question and answer. And if you weren't able to get a book, maybe he'll sign your program for you. But if there are questions, please make your way to the, to the microphones and we'll have a little bit of a question and answer period. And if you don't have questions, I've got plenty, so. Hello? Yes, it is working. Please ask your question and then take your seat. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Arsima Gabramedin. I'm an international student here in Augie. Uh, I am a person who wants to grow spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And I want an advice from you. What should I do to grow? What should I do to change my country? What should I do to change my country who is in poverty? who is in famine, who is in war currently, what should I do? Well, uh, it's something that you have to decide for yourself because I don't know much about your strengths and weaknesses, so I can't advise you in this. But the one thing that we need to do, first of all, before we try to change the country or change the world, is to change ourselves find out our own weaknesses and our own strengths and change those uh, weaknesses into strengths. And then once you have done that, you will find the power and the uh, means to, uh, to change other people and change the world. So we have to take it step at a time. You can't jump uh, before we change. Uh, ourselves. Thank you so much. We'll move to the other side of the room. Hi, my name is Olivia Allen. I'm the education reporter for the Quad City Times, and I just want to open with saying um, thank you so much for delivering such an impactful um, and also insightful lecture. Um, but my question for you is, you know, from your perspective, why is it important for students, uh, particularly in the United States, um, to begin developing an international um, perspective and global consciousness, um, you know, during their undergraduate studies and even at lower levels like um, high school or junior high. Uh, <clears throat> did I understand your question right? Uh, you want to know why American students uh, are not more internationally minded? To why it's important for them to develop that mindset, you know, during their undergraduate studies and even lower levels like high school or junior high. 
I think it's very important uh, for us to know what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, we can't live in isolation and, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately today, uh, because of the uh, economic uh, uh, system that we have created, uh, once people get educated, they are in a hurry to go out and make money and, and uh, have fun in life. So by then, <coughs> learning about the world and <coughs> excuse me, learning about uh, other people becomes more difficult. So we, we start at the younger age and introduce them to all of these things that are going on in the world. Then, <coughs> sorry, then they would uh, be able to learn more and, and fit into uh, working for other people because it requires a lot of compassion. You know, without compassion, you can't uh, work for others or do anything for others. And compassion can come only through uh, knowledge and, and understanding. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Namaste, Mr. Gandhi. It is an honor for all of us to have you in Augustana College. Um, my question to you is, is there any circumstance or situation where you think violence is deemed necessary? For instance, um, our consumption in today's time has to do, a lot, to do a lot with animals. We slaughter animals in the name of religion. We consume animals. Um, so is there any situation as such this that you think violence is appropriate or necessary? Well, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. I would say, of course, um, you know, in um, a situation like sitting here in the hall, and if somebody were to come with a gun and start shooting people, um, you know, without any r rhyme or reason, then it would be appropriate to use some violence to disarm that person and save everybody else, which would be also practical in a one-to-one -one situation. And, uh, you know, just enough violence to disarm the person, person uh, not to kill the person and destroy the person, but to disarm him and uh, save your loved ones. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, you brought up the issue of animals. Um, it is, I don't think, appropriate for us to uh, kill animals for sport. Uh, there are a lot of people who go out just for the sport of enjoying uh, killing animals and shooting animals. And I don't think that is an appropriate sport. Uh, I think there needs to be more understanding and compassion. On the larger scale of slaughtering animals for consumption, um, that is something that has been going on for a while. And uh, I think it's part of nature where animals kill also to, uh, for consumption, and it just, it's a cycle that goes on. So right now I would focus more on uh, the uh, violence that is, exists between people and uh, not so much about the other extraneous things. Thank you so much, Mr. Gandhi. Sure, we'll stay on that side of the room, please, sir. 10 years ago, I saw you not far from here uh, in Moline, Illinois, and it is an absolute honor to see you again, sir. I Thank worked you. in special education um, in an elementary school, 
And lately, I've been finding it quite difficult to deal with the pressures of my job, um, and it's manifesting itself in anger uh, quite often. Um, I do not want to bring that with me to my job and to my students. Um, however, I am feeling this, uh, and I have to admit that. So can you offer me some suggestions or ideas or uh, perhaps another way of thinking on how I can deal with the pressures that we all feel, um, but I'm especially feeling this right now for the first time in my life where it's manifesting as almost an anger, um, and how can I uh, deal with this? Well, I think first of all, you need to identify the reasons why you're moved to anger. What is it that moves you to anger? And what uh, can be done by you or by others to uh, rectify that situation? Um, I'm assuming that you are angry about something that is happening and you don't like that uh, what is happening. So in, you need to go deeper into uh, that issue and, um, you know, see what you can do and what others can do to change it. Thank you so very much. Move to the other side of the room, please. Hello. I have a question um, specifically for my generation as we continue to grapple with all the different social justice movements. Uh, specifically, I wanted to ask what your opinion was on if violence is ever justified as a catalyst for social justice movements or for change within our system and society. No, I think that we need to avoid violence as much as possible. When we start justifying violence in situations, then there is no end to it, and that is how violence proliferates. So um, our um, attempt should be to uh, reduce violence and make it non-existent as much, much as possible. And for that, uh, we have to understand, as I said, the, all the different nuances of violence, the physical and the passive, and the verbal violence that we, uh, you know, uh, show. I've seen in many so-called nonviolent protest movements, there's a tremendous amount of anger and frustration that is expressed in those movements. And that goes against the uh, nonviolent uh, movement. Because grandfather said in nonviolence, we don't have enemies. We are transforming friends. That should be the mindset. The moment we start defining people as enemies because they don't agree with us or they don't do what we want them to do, then we are creating a division between people. But if we approach the problem uh, in the sense that uh, they are friends but they are misguided and we need to transform them and change them, so the approach would be more respectful and loving and uh, transforming them through res respect and love. Hi, my name is Corey. I am an Ecuadorian American from Northern Minnesota, um, a guest here with some wonderful professors. And my friend Aspar and I are, are canoeing the entire Mississippi River right now. We're almost halfway done. And we are learning lots of lessons from nature some very difficult and some that bring us a lot of peace. And I was curious, what moments of peace or profound beauty have you found with water or nature, or where do you go in nature to ground yourself and feel peace? I think uh, there's a lot of peace in nature, and uh, you know, uh, all the rivers and, and water, and so I do go out into the nature and uh, spend time uh, and reflect, because that is the uh, ideal place to uh, 
uh, get away from all the uh, human interactions and, and be with nature and learn some things from nature. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Gandhi. Um, I'm a first year student. My name is Maitri Shrikande. And uh, in my class, we've been learning um, a lot about philosophy and sort of looking at things from a different perspective and a different lens. Um, I feel that my generation, we've grown up to see America become extremely po polarized. And um, there's a lot of times where you might be speaking with someone who has a completely different opinion than you and you cannot even fathom what it's like for them to see through that lens. And I was wondering, do you have any advice on how to step into another person's shoes without feeling that anger? Um, because sometimes I struggle to like, I guess, see from a different person's perspective. Yeah, it is very difficult and it's happening because of the culture of violence that, uh, you know, is, has become a part of our nature and part of our life. And that is because of the, um, the um, lifestyle that we have chosen, where we are very selfish and self-centered and we think about ourselves and not about other people and, and so on. So, yeah, it reflects in the politics of the country also. And we see this more and more in this election, how polarized uh, we are, all are and how um, angry we are with each other. And that shouldn't be the case. Because I know in my own lifetime in this country, I've seen Democrats and Republicans fighting in the Senate and the Congress, uh, you know, expressing all their uh, opposition there. When once they come out from there, they used to be good friends and they would go to each other's parties and, and have fun together and, and uh, talk with each other and have good relationships. It happened as, you know, even in the 1980s and uh, 1990s. It's only recently, suddenly, that there's been a polarization and, uh, and hate has taken over. And it's very uh, unhappy situation. But the only way that we can change this is to realize that uh, people will have different ideas and different beliefs. And we have to respect those beliefs. We may not agree with those beliefs, there, but we don't have to um, take a stand or, or denounce them, uh, you know, in in an insulting way. Thank you. Hello, sir. My name is Priyanka. Um, so I have a question that's more on the philosophical and religious side. Um, in Hindu religion, we have many texts that says um, violence is necessary in order for good to win over evil, such as Mahabharata or Ram Ramayana. And um, I, I'm, I've heard that you know Mahatma Gandhi was a very religious person. So what do you and what did Mahatma Gandhi think about um, having war for good to win over evil? Because that's a that is violence and it kind of goes against his beliefs. Uh, what do you think about that? <clears throat> well, um, both my grandfather and I agree with him and he said, <coughs> unfortunately we have all misinterpreted our religions and justified what we want uh, religion to justify. So the issue that you brought about the Mahabharat uh, and the war that took place there, uh, grandfather said that that was not a real war. It was uh, the writer took liberty, took poetic justice, and uh, defined the conflict that goes on in our minds every day 
between good and bad, the choices that we have to make in our minds every day individually, that conflict has been depicted in terms of a war between good and evil. So it's not an actual war. It's not like picking up a, a weapons and going and fighting a war, but it's a depiction of the conflicts within our minds, uh, and we have to accept it in that term. Thank you. My name is Sagi, and um, I'm a junior at Agustana. I'm the first student from Iran on this campus, and I just wanted to ask your um, view and advice, I guess, on um, everything that's been going on in Iran for the past two months. Um, I know that it has had um, more news coverage than um, Iran has gotten in the past decades, and um, I would say that thousands of young men and women my age have been um, imprisoned in the past few months for just expressing their human rights, basic human rights, and um, seeking their rights in the government. And um, it's really upsetting for me to see that happening and see that unfolding in my country when I'm thousands of miles away. And I just wanted to see what your advice was um, for me in people in my generation and people who are um, not in the country exper uh, experiencing that and how they can advocate and raise awareness for issues like this? Well, I think if we want justice in the world, then uh, we have to take a stand and, and uh, you know, if that means going to prisons or even sacrificing your life uh, for a worthy cause. It's something that we have to do. Uh, Indians did it in India during the uh, colonial rule to get independence, and uh, they went to prisons for long periods of time, many uh, hundreds, if not thousands of young people died in the process. So unfortunately, that sacrifice is called for because of the uh, <coughs> <coughs> the evils that uh, uh, has taken over and, uh, and the government uh, practice a lot of uh, evil things that, uh, you know, go against human rights and, and so on. So um, I think if you feel strongly about it, uh, you should go back and join the young people there because without that sacrifice, we will not be able to make a change. Thank you. Namaskar, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, there have been some fantastic questions here, so uh, most of them uh, have, what I was thinking of, have already been asked, but I have a a comment for, I request a comment from you. Mm. What would Bapuji be thinking, if you can take a moment to step into his sandals, what would Bapuji be thinking about Rishi Saunak being the Prime Minister of England? Our world has changed so much. I'm just curious as to what Bapuji would be thinking right now of that. Well, I, I don't know. <clears throat> uh, he would, uh, he disliked politics, and he said if we can get rid of politicians, this world would be a better place. <laughs> so, just because he's an Indian and became a prime minister by accident <laughs> in England, I don't think that's a, something that we need to rejoice. We'll have to wait and see what does he do with that power and what good does, does he bring, do in the, uh, in the world. Then uh, it's something that we can rejoice. But otherwise, I don't see any reason for rejoicing just because Britain elected an Indian prime minister. 
Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Hello, Dr. Arangadi. My name is Aaron Watson. I'm a small business owner right here in the Quad Cities. I know this thing raises up, so I'm kind of out, right? I'm like 6'5 here. So um, <clears throat> I guess my main question uh, for you, Mr. Gandhi, is what is it, what is it necessarily going to take for, OK, so I'm from the inner city of the Quad Cities. And, and so I've witnessed and seen a lot when it comes to over-criminalization of uh, minorities and, and uh, poverty and the uh, lack of, um, of education and, uh, you know, and, and so forth and so much. Uh, affordable housing is, is so uh, crazy right now with the homelessness and the amount of homelessness in, in the Quad Cities. Now, uh, we know that there's people in, in power and we know that there's people of the masses and elite who can actually help and we know that um, they see what is happening and what is going on, as well as I do, whether I'm there with the minorities or not. We know that the elite, and we know that those who are um, in power to help, should I say in short. Um, what is it going to take for those uh, who can help to not continue to turn a blind eye on uh, situations here um, within ourselves, not even just America, as we know, the world is, um, you know, it's, it's pretty hectic. But let's, even if I can start right here, what is it going to take for me or for us in order to get those who can help or those who see or um, those who aren't even involved in what is taking place and going on? What, what could it take? What would it take for us to uh, no longer turn a blind eye? And, <clears throat> and, uh, well, on the larger scale, I think what it takes is changing the entire system that we have created, which uh, benefits the privileged and not the, uh, the entire community. Until we do that, we are going to have these disparities, and uh, the poor are going to get poorer, and the rich are going to get richer. And unfortunately, um, the charity that we do to help the poor people is a charity that is uh, motivated by pity. And so we uh, go on feeding the poor or giving them uh, things uh, at, at times. And that only makes them more and more dependent uh, on people and society uh, for their needs. What we need to do is charity motivated by compassion. And that is different because then when you're motivated by compassion, you just don't give people things that they need, but you sit down and talk to them and find out why are they in that situation and what kind of strengths do they have which can be used to make them realize their own potential. Uh, you know, people who have to live in poverty, the first thing that they lose is their self-respect and self-confidence. Uh, they believe what society tells them, that they are worthless, useless people who will never be able to achieve anything uh, and so they'll be perpetually dependent on society uh, for charity and for food and, and so on. And they begin to believe that. And that's not true because each one of us has the strength and has the capacity. And if we can only pinpoint that strength and make, it, make them aware of it, and then help them <coughs> achieve <coughs> Take this out. achieve uh, you know their uh, own economic stability. That would be a greater help to them, and th that would be a permanent help. Then they won't be dependent on permanent you help. forever. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Excellent. you know it, it's. Uh, question of how much time and energy 
that we want to spend in helping people. When we are motivated by pity, it's very easy to take out a few dollars and put it in their can and walk away from there and say, we've done our good deed for the day. And that's quick, you know, and you satisfy yourself and walk away. You don't know what that person is going to do with that money. Whether that person is going to buy cigarettes and alcohol and smoke or buy food or what. And you don't care about it. But when you work with compassion, then you sit and talk and get down to their level and understand their problems properly. Not go with the arrogance that I know what your problem is and uh, listen to me and I, you'll solve it. Because we don't know what it means to live in poverty. We don't know what it means to live in hunger. We don't know what it means to live in the circumstances they find themselves. Because we have never lived there. So it's important for us to have that humility to sit down and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and learn from them, and then help them. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Mr. Gandhi. That helped a lot. We've got, we've got one more question here, and then we're going to move into the book signing. OK. So do you think that there is any safe way, other than through meditation, to express your anger? Any safe way to express anger? I other don't think other than any like meditation. I, you know, I'm, I think what you're wanting to know is if there's any way you can get the anger out of your system. And uh, no, there is no safe way of getting it out of your system except by uh, resolving the issue. Uh, I have heard people say, you can go out into nature and yell at nature and to get the anger out there. Nobody is going to listen to you there and nobody will be affected by it. But that doesn't help. You get that anger out of your system for that moment. But when you get back into society, that issue that caused the anger is going to be there and you get angry again. So unless you resolve that issue and spend time over that, there is no other way that you can get rid of that anger. Thank you. What wonderful questions we've had this evening. Uh, as they begin to bring the, well, let's give uh, Dr. Gandhi another round of applause. Why don't we start there? They're going to bring a, a table to the front here. Um, and for those of you who have books that you want signed or your program signed, please just begin to line up here at the stairs that are in the center and we'll get right to the book signing in just a few minutes. <laughs> 